Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our, uh, at least this is my first time uh, leading this uh, builder's call. Um, I like to keep things relatively formal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, relatively informal, actually. Uh, correct. This is going to be kind of more discussion. Uh, some of this stuff might actually be new information for folks. Uh, and so if anything is is new, if you're curious about anything, feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to uh, uh, make a comment, what have you. I'm not quite. I, I would ha hate to uh, put myself at the level of jinx in terms of uh, being able to manage all the different uh, feeds and, and follow everything going on uh, while also uh so bear with me with this but uh yeah excited to get started here so let me go ahead and share my screen Let's see all right uh i assume okay looks see. like looks like everything's shared awesome okay so this is the builder's call uh, yeah, we, we have a pretty simple agenda. Uh, we're going to go through kind of a new format and then uh, going to do some deep dive into Shannon architecture, uh, talk about some builder possibilities, uh, and then Zach's going to take over talking about some current grants and then uh, open the floor to just discussion. So kicking it off, goals. Uh, pretty easy. None of this is you know, really complex. Uh, ultimately, our goal is to provide deep dives into relevant uh, protocol topics, um, and specifically ones that relate to builders. Our goal is when you leave here, you understand things that uh, is going on inside the protocol. You understand things that are going on inside of Shannon so that you can build. This is ultimately about builders. And so we want to provide the best information for you. Um, so then with that is number two is just provide you with all the best information and updates, uh, regardless if it's just strictly protocol, if it's also Anything that is relevant to builders, that's what we want to be able to uh, focus on and provide you in these community calls. Uh, and then we want to uh, explore grant projects, whether it's existing grants, whether it's upcoming grants. Uh, we want to make it so folks know how to plug into the ecosystem. So to start off with, uh, this is, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, I know for myself, I you know I've read the the different blog posts, uh, I've heard the little tidbits dropped here and there, but I didn't feel like I had a real solid understanding of what exactly the Shannon architecture is, and I've really enjoyed being a part of uh, the protocol team uh, and kind of working with them these basically last two going on three weeks now, uh, as it's exposed me to so much more of what's going on behind the scenes. So what I want to do is just kind of convey what I've been learning in case other people uh, haven't been aware of uh, these kind of finer points of the Sh Shannon architecture so that we can all kind of know where where to focus with this coming Shannon release. So when it comes to the architecture, uh, you have Shannon. But what exactly is Shannon? An important, the most important thing to focus on is that Shannon is built using the Cosmos SDK. I actually was not fully aware of this, that uh, it's being built fully Cosmos SDK compatible. Uh, once I learned that, I, you know, really started to see where exactly this ecosystem goes. Um, but how the Cosmos SDK works into the larger stack is you have the Cosmos SDK, and then kind of a middleware. What Rollkit does is it allows uh, someone that is using the Cosmos SDK to create rollups. Uh, and then those rollups are able then to be deployed to Celestia. So the benefits of this kind of development is uh, the development themselves, the team, they're able to focus on the utility uh, on a well-established framework. Uh, this, the Cosmos SDK, um, it's a phenomenal ecosystem and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and then you have Rollkit, which handles the converting the Cosmos SDK 
uh, to a rollup for Celestia. And then you have Celestia, which just takes care of all the validation. So with this kind of stack, the protocol team is focused on utility on a, on a uh, well-established framework. And then everything else is taken care of uh, by these other platforms. However, we are finding uh, the protocol team is actively finding the challenges of this kind of stack. Uh, because while the protocol team is building with the latest and greatest Cosmos SDK version, which is version 0 0.50, uh, Rollkit uh, is not yet fully compatible with this latest version. So they're actually fully compatible with version 0 0.47, and they're not yet fully compatible with 0 0.50. So as so actually currently, this is one of the biggest challenges that the protocol team is currently deep diving on uh, or swarming on. Uh, they were hoping to have uh, everything ready with this new Cosmos uh, version by the end of the because uh, be because Rollkit isn't fully compatible yet, they're kind of swarming to figure out how to get it fully compatible and how to uh, get everything properly working so that we can actually deploy to Celestia. Because if Rollkit is is not compatible with what uh, with the version of the SDK that we're operating with, it can't uh, it, it it can't send the rollups. It can't for Celestia. So it literally creates a, a break in the, uh, in the architecture. So as the team, this, this iteration, meaning these next like two weeks, they're just heavily focused on figuring out exactly what is required for this migration to the newest Cosmos SDK version and also identifying what, uh, you know, what alternatives there are um, in case it's not fully in case Rollkit isn't able to keep up with uh, what Pocket needs. So I wanted to explain, because I found this fascinating. Once I started to get into how the ecosystem is built uh, or how Shannon is built, it really started to open my mind to all the contingencies that exist. So let's say uh, this, this one on the left, you have the Cosmos SDK, say Rollkit, isn't able to, uh, uh, or is going to be behind what Pocket needs. Uh, there's actually other platforms that can come in and provide rollups uh, similar to Rollkit. And this is where you have Sovereign Labs. Uh, they're, so, they're another uh, solution that Pocket, or that the protocol team has already uh, looked into and considered. And that could literally kind of be a swap and replacement uh, to be able to have this, you know, Cosmos on Celestia. Um, now, you also, Celestia itself, uh, you know, if you go with something like Sovereign Labs, you also then have the possibility of not just only using Celestia, you could potentially use uh, Eigenlayer, uh, what's called Eigen uh, DA. So I'm not fully familiar about that, so I can't answer all the questions about, you know, difference between Celestia and Eigen, but, what it does is it opens up a lot of possibilities. So even uh, contingencies, and you could actually take out Rollkit and put in something like Sovereign Labs. But then say we don't want to go with another middleware uh, for the rollups. There's always the possibility, and I did not know this. I did not realize this. There's always the possibility of just literally taking Shannon and just deploying our own L1 because it's all based on the Cosmos SDK. So this means that you would just deploy directly to uh, uh, what, what is it, Comet uh, BFT, uh, the Comet BFT consensus layer, which is used to be called Tendermint. When they, uh, with their latest version, they have changed the name and, and kind of branding from Tendermint to uh, Cos, Cos, oh wait, uh, Comet, Comet BFT. So we can always go back to having our own validators. Because what Celestia provides, or what Eigenlayer uh, would provide, would be they take care of this uh, kind of this data availability and this uh, validation side. 
So we just focus on the utility of uh, how Pocket actually works on the protocol level, and we don't have to worry about the kind of the blockchain layer uh, and validation. Uh, but we can always just go ahead and bring validation back to uh, back where we have our own L1, and it would be just like any other Cosmos uh, base chain. Uh, and there really isn't any uh, any difference. The benefit of having something like a rollup, uh, the middleware rollup in Celestia, is it just offloads the the uh, the offloads the validation uh, and a number of things from not having to be under pocket. But if those other platforms are going to be we hold back pocket, there still is the possibility of just hey, let's just go ahead and deploy our own. Uh, our own network. We already have thousands of validators anyways, which is typically a big challenge with new networks is just having enough validators. We already have a lot of validators, so we could just actually go to our own L1. Um, yeah, so then validation would be in-house now instead of being uh, instead of being offloaded to Celestio. So any uh, any kind of questions or, or anything of that nature? Shane, we got one in the chat. Um, if we're not our own L1, does it mean that we have to pay, or sorry, that we will have an L2 pocket token, but we'll pay gas fees with an L1 native coin? I actually don't, I have no clue about that. Great question. Uh, so, I mean, if we're not our own L1, does that mean that we have uh, an L2 pocket token? I think, so, uh, like right now, with, with how it would work with Celestia is uh, you do pay a Celestia fee to have your blocks validated. So, uh, and, and that is paid for by the sequencers. Uh, so you have sequencers, which are uh, kind of built as part of the, uh, you, you, the roll up, uh, the, the roll kit, um, uh, the roll up uh, layer, right? You have these sequencers and then then take the data that needs to be validated uh, and be part of the blockchain and submits it to the Celestia network. Um, and then when that, just like how on any network to have your data validated on that network, you have to pay that, that token. So I don't, so we wouldn't be using our pocket token for validating. Uh, that's because the validating would happen on Celestia. But most, you know, nodes or a few sequencers that would be uh you know dealing with the celestia you know blockchain so yes in terms of there would be there would be kind of another token that you pay the uh the l1 uh you would pay in their token not in the pocket token pocket token would strictly be used for utility not for block confirmations i this is probably not the combo for that, but I'd love a bigger breakdown on it because I, I still don't quite understand. Does that mean that we'd have two tokens? No, what we have one. Ones? So yeah. we have one token that is used for paying for RPC. Okay, so uh, to deal with you know claims and proofs and burning and all that all that jazz, everything dealing with the economics of of uh, using Pocket uses the Pocket token where another token would come in in this stack if we're using celestia underneath pocket then to uh to get that data to pay the gas fees for that data to be on the celestia network you then pay using the celestia token so uh and and wow. that would only be very specific actors and if you look at rollups they're known as sequencers Sequencers are going to be the ones that organize this Celestia blockchain. And those sequencers, uh, it's it's not like, you know, anyone becomes a sequencer. It's kind of like a set amount of sequencers uh, would be, you know, would be doing this job on behalf of the pocket network, while the pocket token itself is being used by developers. It's being, it's what is, uh, you know, generating reward for node runners and everything of that nature. But uh, so the whole using Pact, and they would stake with Pact everything. The only difference is these few actors, known as sequencers, 
they would have to pay the Celestia fee or whatever the L2 fee is um, uh, in what in, in that native coin. Uh, imagine, uh, okay, so I got another one uh, from Coder here. Uh, imagine L2 tokens such as USDT, you cannot send uh you cannot send usdt uh you uh you also need eth for the network gas fee right so in this case you would have celestia C celestia's coin would be what you pay the gas fees in um unless celestia has some other mechanism but um yeah you would have a few sequencers that would have to have the token of whatever the underlying blockchain is underneath that's doing our validation Thanks, Shane. Super yeah. helpful. All right. So that so what this is meant to do is really it's just meant to show you the main takeaway is that regardless of what the stack looks like, Shannon is based on that's uh, the the important part here for builders. Uh, the protocol team again they're they're working out this migration issue. They're figuring out okay, is it better to uh, you know. Should we continue working on the uh, roll kit side, or should we, you know, go to a different um, roll up middleware, uh, or should we, you know, kind of be in L1 where you know everything's able to be handled directly through the pocket token? Uh, all that is still being figured out. That doesn't actually stop or hold back uh, really much of Shannon's progress at all because it's all built on the Cosmos SDK converting from a roll kit uh, based you know product on Celestia to just being an L1 is actually a very straightforward process because everything is already on the Cosmos S utilizing Cosmos SDK. So with that, this actually creates oh wait uh, oh oh okay, okay. Uh, Sorry, I got I got a little mixed up. So uh, so what does this look like in terms of timeline? So the February uh, goal, uh, the goals for February is to finish the the migration to the latest Cosmos, um, and then to launch an alpha testnet, uh, a closed alpha testnet. This is mainly just to uh, just to confirm that uh, validation is properly happening and all, all things of that nature, and then uh, finalize deployment tools. Uh, and then March is where things start to open up for builders because there's going to be the launch of a public testnet. Uh, and then the protocol team is going to be focused on Shannon SDK testing uh, and gateway testing. So actually start testing the um, uh, the actual utility side of the protocol once a public mainnet, uh, mainnet is launched. Uh, and so what this means for builders specifically is builders can Shannon tools once the testnet is launched. So we're really hoping next month is when builders can start going ham with uh, building, you know, either your existing services or thinking of new services, what have you, uh, utilizing the public testnet, which again is all Cosmos SDK based. Uh, I see there's a a, a question here. Uh, if we launch, uh, if we launch towards L1. Nodes to one. Oh, I, I think this is uh, fifteen chains. Yeah, this is talking about. Uh, I, I, I believe uh, hmm. this is talking about max chains. Yeah, max chains would would be. Um, it, it'll be different in Shannon than than currently how it is. Uh, at least with uh, what it the initial um, what it initially looks like. And we're going to be releasing more information. I'm actually helping work on kind of the migration plan and the migration strategy from uh, in the parity strategy of Morse to Shannon. So we're actually going to be releasing stuff this month, uh, which everyone will be able to look at and see what is really the the difference between Morse and Shannon in terms of the economics would look like. So more 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 information on that is is going to be coming. So I can't answer all those questions yet. Um, but Going back to my slide, uh, builder possibilities. Uh, really, at the end of the day, builders, all you need to keep in mind is the Cosmos SDK, because 
we now are compatible with a world of tools that are all built off the Cosmos SDK. So this means that we can be integrated immediately, basically into wallets. Uh, there's all sorts of explorers that are already built for the Cosmos SDK, bridges, et cetera. So anything you can really, most any ecosystem would work and can be used inside of Pocket now. Um, before Pocket was was very hard to build with. Um, it was it was, there was a significant learning curve when you needed to build with with Morse, uh, and that's because we were then this fork of Cosmos, and then we didn't progress with the ecosystem. Uh, but now we're actually we're going to be uh, part of that same stream. So anything that exists for the within side of uh, uh, with inside a pocket. And so, you know, a good example here is something like explorers. Uh, I know in the forum there's been talk about, you know, having an open source explorer. And part of the challenge was, is there's just such a significant learning curve with Morse to getting all the right data, uh, operating inside of uh, the confusing, uh, you know, this old, very old version of Tendermint and all this stuff. However, there's a lot of open source explorers that are already Cosmos SDK compatible. And so plugging Pocket into these other explorers or launching your own explorer with modifications that are Pocket focused, uh, but using the base of one of these other open source explorers, there's a lot of cool possibilities there. Um, so this basically means Shannon is very approachable. And uh, with the test net uh, coming up in March, there's going to be a lot of cool opportunity. Um, and so we're hoping folks will really take the initiative. Uh, PNF is already expecting to have you know grants start becoming available after public test net. Um, and uh, kind of with that, uh, kind of the focus of grants is to start focusing and start shifting focus to Shannon versus Morse. So uh, grants that are specifically focused on Morse work, uh, they're going to be phased out, which you'll you'll probably see in the coming uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, but then grants, uh, but then and you know Shannon uh, grants, which again, because Sh Shannon is built off the Cosmos SDK, opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, and then quick grants, also known as sockets, uh, they will be a great way for new projects to get started. So we're really excited to see what starts to happen in the uh, in the coming future, because there's a a lot, a, a whole new world of possibilities are opening up through the uh, Shannon being built with the Cosmos SDK. Let's see. Are there any, uh, yeah, any questions? <laughs> great one. <laughs> Yeah, any questions, uh, any thoughts? Uh, I, I've been talking for a little while here, so I so, uh, want to give everyone an opportunity here to speak up. Yeah, I've got a couple quick ones. The first one is just around the version of Cosmos SDK. Was there a super um, compelling reason that the team wanted to build on the latest Cosmos SDK despite the version mismatch with rollkit or like the support mismatch with rollkit like are there any super compelling features or functionalities in that latest version that they really want to have available for shannon you know that's a good that's a good question i don't have the uh i'm actually not sure if there's a specific feature that is inside the latest uh the latest um uh version that they like needed uh, I don't believe there was like, oh man, we have to do this because of the newest feature. Uh, the big difference uh, between 45 and 50 in the versioning was actually quite large though. It was a, a very large update that actually changed how uh, modules work inside of, the, uh, inside of Cosmos. So uh, Cosmos is built to be modular for the literally the foundation of, of the value of the Cosmos SDK. Well, this version dramatically changed modules. So I don't know if that uh, module or if that version has some kind of feature that Shannon needed. I don't think it had something that Shannon needed, quote unquote, but it is a significant change in the, in the, uh, in the ecosystem and all this work Right. And uh, so that so they've been building using the latest, but
but it's just not compatible with something like RollKit. And there's, at least right now, there's there's no timeline on when it will be made available, right? So that's always the risk when you have a middleware inside of your stack, because if they don't upgrade, you're kind of you're kind of stuck. Now, we're not stuck because we could always migrate to our own chain or migrate somewhere else, but making those kind of changes is, you know, it's easy to do it before Shannon launches, but it'd be very complex and convoluted to do that regularly uh, after Shannon is launched and after we already have a mainnet, right? So that's why right now we could actually move quickly between, oh, let's just go from Rollkit to something else uh, or even do our own L1. We can do that really quickly. Doing that once mainnet exists and launches, oof, that's that's no easy undertaking. So that's the reason the team is very focused right now on feeling out what dependency on these platforms would uh, would create in the long term for Pocket. Got it. That makes a ton of sense. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Hey, folks, uh, if I may, I want to double down on the uh, documentation parts. You mentioned a little bit more documentation is coming, but we really need, you know, even more uh, more documentation on the architecture, what's going to change for node runners, for stakers, for investors, for all the different actors. And, you know, what, what are the changes uh, as far as the operations go from uh, V0 to V1? Uh, Imagine we are making a consensus breaking proposal uh, for V0, right? Imagine the scrutiny that we are going through. This is mother of all you know, consensus breaking changes. This is a complete rewrite of everything and new approaches, new tokenomics, perhaps. Uh, we need to start discussing those. This call here is really nice, but this is online, right? And how many people are here? Maybe, maybe 20 people. Uh, we need to open this up to the ecosystem so people can read, think, give feedback, and we need to do those before it is uh, too late, right? We don't want to be in the case that, oh, should we completely miss that, but too bad we already wrote everything and now we are locked into this. You know, we wish we, you know, heard this feedback uh, sooner. So when do you think that can happen or is there anyone actually working on that? Yeah, actually, I can say that I that that's actually what a good part of my a, a good part of my uh, uh, week was was actually kind of going through uh, the migration or the parity the parity check between Shannon and uh, and and Morse right Morse to Shannon. So that's actually a huge part of what I'm kind of working on right now. Uh, I'm starting to get acclimated with kind of the protocol with all the uh, with all the different uh, resources that they have because they they did a basic they did a very basic uh, kind of breakdown of Shan of Morse to Shannon uh, and what you know what features are carrying over which ones aren't missing um, and part of that was because it takes someone who you know is actively involved in the protocol like myself that understands all the different stakeholders in a more intimate level so i actually already identified a number of areas that were missing so what i'm trying to do right now is kind of get everything together um into a a either a single you know a single source or a few sources but get everything together and then the whole idea is none of this is moving forward with and allowing folks to be engaged and be involved in the discussions uh, with with how this migration or how this parity would be in terms of future parity. So and how it affects different stakeholders. So all of that is absolutely going to be uh, be shared. That's actively what I'm kind of doing right now. I'm still getting my you know getting my full bearing and and literally consuming insane amount of information right now. <laughs> like yeah, I'm. I, I'm just taking in tons of information right now, trying to get it all sorted. But that that's part of the reason why they wanted to bring me on is because I do have a very good understanding of all the different stakeholders inside the Pocket ecosystem, uh, having built in a number of the different verticals myself. So uh, they just needed someone that had that had that kind of ability to look at all these different stakeholders, identify where there might be gaps, because the developers themselves are just looking, oh, okay, yes, this, uh, this is Morris, this is Shannon, uh and but not realizing what that effect would create so yeah i'm i'm 
putting myself a little bit on the spot here in terms of that's one of my big focuses right now. And we hope to this iteration, so like in the next two weeks, uh, re start releasing this kind of information that people can look at. Uh, and there, I think there's probably going to be some decisions that the DAO is going to have to make. Like, okay, what uh, if we don't have this or if, it, if this looks a little that okay? How does that affect the ecosystem? And there's going to be decisions that are going to have to be made. So I completely agree with you there, Coder. Thank you. Um, and and also, you know, part of part of my myself being uh, uh, kind of joining the team in this, you know, kind of outsider. Uh, in these calls as well. So this is a good way to also get more information. And in any of the community calls, folks are welcome to ask questions. Uh, and I'll just let you know where we're at right now, kind of, you know, where 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 the pro where where we're at with that particular question. So yeah, feel free to to keep asking. Shane, can I um I'm gonna just Take another step here. I, I think that what we're saying too is that building tools for Pocket can also put you in a position where you're building tools for the rest of the Cosmos ecosystem, right? So, like to extrapolate it, if there are other like retro PGF rounds and other things that are happening within that ecosystem, we're now eligible for that. Is that correct? Hmm, that's actually a good. Uh, that's actually a good question. I believe. You know, I believe so. I mean, if you're building something with the Cosmos SDK in mind, I mean, it depends on what exactly you're building, right? Uh, I mean, because like, say, let's take the uh, Explorer for an example. Uh, if you're building an Explorer that's that's you know similar to something like Pocket Scan, there's going to be a lot of information uh, there that isn't necessarily going to translate to other um, other ecosystems uh, because Pocket is so strictly a utility. Uh, we have a lot of different type of data um, than what most have. So, uh, so maybe something that's built in Pocket doesn't necessarily translate because it's so tailored to Pocket. But things that that are general in terms of uh, you know there could actually be some node deployment uh, or, or node staking tools or things of that nature. Uh, what have you that that people build or wallets. Right. Uh, actually, you know, Node Wallet, which is what we built for Morse, uh, we, we we built so we can easily add uh, the Cosmos SDK to it to make it Shannon compatible. But uh, you know, Pocket will technically be ready to work in all these other uh, wallets as well. Now they might not have uh, you know the same kind of uh, you know. Uh, features that will be in Node Wallet, where you know a provider can just say, "Hey, stake with us," and just boom, everything. Uh, they just have a button on their uh, on their website, and you just immediately stake with them through a button. You know, there there's certain things that might that will probably be in Node Wallet that will not be in these other wallets. But uh, there is huge amount of transferability in terms of if it works for Pocket, it works for these other ecosystems. So. Yeah, that, that's a real possibility. Someone could kind of build something and have it be pocket focus um, or, or build something for pocket, but then it could actually be utilized with inside all these other ecosystems. And there there might be all sorts of ways to get grants, yeah, across these different ecosystems um, if they, uh, uh, you know, with, with a product that's kind of built inside pocket. Very possible. All right. Uh, any any other kind of questions or comments on this uh, on on this kind of area? Because uh, last warning, because we're about to go to Zach. So, I mean, if you really want to go to Zach, uh, if you don't want to go to Zach yet, then uh, now's the time. All right, you asked for it. All right, Zach, take it away. Thanks, buddy. Share screen real quick. All 
All right. Okay. So um, one, thank you, Shane. This is hugely helpful. Um, I feel like I got more out of this last like 40 minutes than I have in months. So um, this is this is the kind of stuff that I was envisioning with the builders call to begin with is, you know, how are we telling people what's important, um, what things they need to be aware of, and really just like if we're going to activate a community to build important things for our protocol, how do we how do we make sure everybody's up to speed on that? So I think this is a really great start. And I want to say thank you to everybody who's here. I know it's a mix of um, gateways and nodes and builders and sockets. So um, the format that we're playing with is going to change a little bit, but really the goal is to keep everybody who is building stuff for the protocol in the same space so we can have these great conversations. Um, I have a couple of like kind of housekeeping notes here just for, for the grant. So I've said it before, but we are changing the idea of pops and sockets to be more in line with what the rest of the ecosystem is calling them. So going forward, sockets are gonna be quick grants um, and pops will be RFPs. And we're just doing that so that way when people are talking to people outside of our ecosystem, they understand um, what they are more easily. And so um, if you do see that nomenclature needs to be updated somewhere, please ping me, let me know. Um, we'll be working over that over the next couple of weeks, I'm sure. Um, let's see. For the sockets, I have a few people here that are are getting paid out of the um, out of the DAO funds here. Everybody should be set up on a hedgy stream, and I just want to give you the opportunity now. If you aren't getting paid or don't know how to access that, um, please unmute or type in the chat here. Um, or additionally, if you have done it and it was cumbersome or hard to figure out, I, I would appreciate that feedback as well. And this is for people who have an open socket. Well, open quick grant, I guess. All right. Four, four sockets, four quick grants going forward. Um, I realize that measuring impact has been a little bit nebulous. It's kind of been up to the socket opener to figure out what that what that means. Uh, for next month, I'm going to incorporate a tool called Karma Gap. And basically what it means is if the DAO is paying you to do work, you're responsible for kind of rating yourself via a series of questions on um, <laughs> basically what impact are you delivering and how does it deliver towards some of our bigger goals. It should actually make your end of month um, reporting much easier because you have questions to answer. And then month over month, we'll be able to um, look at those and see how we're, how we're growing or um, if they need to change. The other piece of this is, um, the other piece of this is uh, reviewing it. So currently the only people that review grants are me. Um, and I would love to put it to everybody here. We kind of have two paths we can go where either everybody who's receiving some sort of grant from the DAO is responsible for reviewing other um, reviewing other recipients of the grant. So for example, if I'm getting a if I'm getting a quick grant and Peter from CoUni is getting one, we're both responsible to write how we are delivering impact each month. But then we're also responsible for going through and rating each other on how valuable we think that these um, grants are. Uh, there's a way to do it anonymously, which means that, I can like just basically using a you know a ZK. Um, I can check that everybody has done their reviews, and I can but I can't see which review was done by each person. And reviewing other grants is pretty simple. It's you know a series of I think ten questions, and you rate it on a one to five uh, scale. So we can go through those as a as a team and look at which ones are delivering impact, which ones are not. And then to extrapolate one step further, I think the big piece here is. When we go to do things like retro PGF rounds, where um, we do a, distrib a distribution of funds based on what has done impact, it's going to be a lot less work for those of you that are doing it. You're not going to have to go back and say, oh, I did these 10 projects. Um, let me grab that for you. You're not going to have to go back and say, I've done these 10 projects. And then um, write all the impact for those 10 projects. So. I wanted to put that idea out there as I think it's going to be easier for everybody. It's going to be easier for me reviewing. And then it's also going to be um, more DAO focused. So the entire community is going to be rating what they think other people are doing, what's valuable. And that'll help us um, dial in on things. So for example, if we're finding that we have lots of documentation um, sockets that are not providing value, we can be more, we can have more scrutiny around that with the next one that opens. So 
Um, Peter, we can solve that with you. If you want to just DM me, we can make sure that happens. Um, so the other two things I wanted to talk about here, so the dashboard, we have our community metrics, and then this is um, all of the people that are getting paid out of the DAO to Hedgy. It does get updated on the, the 1st and the 15th. So if you're an in-between one, um, yeah, exactly what Ben's saying. As part of the multi-sig, we can queue it up, but then we need somebody else to sign it. Um, and our three multi-sigs are all in different time zones of the world. So it takes 24 hours at least to get them up. Um, but yeah, that's the token grants from Hedgy. I think you can see here, this is showing what we're, what we're spending um, and where it's going. I do want to flag here that um, the total granted, this is based on, um, I think, three months. So this is actually inaccurate. This is not a per month spend. Um, but this is a little bit more accurate of what's happening right now. So, uh, yeah, definitely would appreciate any feedback from you all on what you like, what you want to see more of, that kind of stuff. Um, okay, cool. So we did our review of all the open, all the quick grants for the month. This is what's currently active. We closed down four of them last month. A couple of people hadn't given reviews, um, and a couple of these seemed like they were at the end of their life cycle. So trying to close that down and be more responsible with the funds. The thing I want to try today, a little bit different, is I'd like everybody who's here that has a quick grant to, just to give me like a 30 second to one minute update on what you're building, if you have any blockers, and if you could use help anywhere. So putting people on the spot here, um, is there anybody who would like to go first? Otherwise, I'm just going to kind of run down the list top to bottom. Yeah, I can I could just kind of kick things off. Uh, yeah, Node Wallet, uh, our, uh, our grant. Uh, right now we don't have any, we don't have any blockers, so we don't really have any blockers. Um, uh, we have some features that we plan to push this next month. Um, and we're, uh, talking, uh, with PNF about, uh, you know, adding, um, uh, ledger integration and things of that nature. So, yeah, so not, not really any blocks, uh, but, uh, planned for this month. So uh, yeah, good on our side. Thanks, Shane. And thanks for the kickoff. And uh, maybe an update for everybody here. Uh, as we go into as we go into creds, which is the new governance, um, Node Wallet is going to be the only officially supported one because of the SDK that they've built. Um, so we are going to be requiring people to have a node wallet wallet in order to be a DAO voter um, and get your get your access here. We'll have more information on that. Um, I also just want to say totally personally biased. Um, you know, the node wallet experience is currently the best experience for having a wallet and the only one that's being actively maintained. So um, if we want to talk more about that at the end in the open floor, please feel free to to open up on that. Okay. Uh, next up on the list, uh, Dan, I think you, oh, actually, Peter, you're at the top here. Peter, do you want to give a quick update? Yeah, I can give an update. Um, so the main thing that I think would be worth updating on is, um, I'm currently working on a quest for the node running. And what that means is we are, uh, Underverse and um, what which essentially enables us to create like onboarding quests and kind of a, like almost like people uh, you know they join the server and then they have to complete certain tasks in order to access sections and what we're planning on doing is um, essentially gating access to the node runner category in the server behind completing a quest and that's sort of like you know, a quest that allows us to gauge, you know, what is the level of experience of new people joining the server when it comes to node running and then send them through a series of tasks, which currently involves um, reading the documentation, watching a video, filling out a little bit of like a quiz and then getting access to the node runners chat. And I've actually made a post about that. Um, under the node runners uh well general chat channel um asking for support from pretty much anyone who knows a lot about node running and wants to contribute to that um that's one of the main things i'm work i'm working on right now 
And then there's other quests that are going to come up after that for like devs, um, core devs, and a few other things. But yeah, that's what I'm working on. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, and we do have a individual channels under sockets for each of the different ones. So Peter, I don't know if you want to put a little note into your channel and ask for some feedback there or direct them to that. That would be really helpful, I think. Great. Uh, Dan, you're up next. Well, as you know, we just, uh, just got to meet ads right before this builder's call, which was awesome and discuss a little bit about the analytics I'm providing on the community side. And I think there's a lot of details and things like that I can get into all across the board with messages, with uh, different audiences, different countries kind of popping up and just these insights into, you know, the Discord, the community and the Telegram chats. It's kind of like the bottom of the funnel, you know, the top is the website, the social medias, et cetera, and then understanding like the actions and what different people are doing on the bottom of the funnel can give a little bit more insights on the quality of users entering the ecosystem and whatnot, which can help out with ads with um, where she's going to acquire new interest and new people for people um, coming into pocket. So it was a really good conversation. Um, we discussed, uh, I think for this next month, which will be really interesting, a new tool that we're going to bring in. It's an analytics tool called Cookie 3, and it helps a lot with um, website analytics and on-chain analytics. So you can think of it like Google Analytics mixed with uh, Etherscan <laughs> as a product in a way. And so it'll be interesting to get some insights around wrap pocket holders, um, what are like the secondary holdings and things like that, as well as on the website traffic side, what's the percentage of people who just have a Chrome extension of a Web3 wallet? Um, and there's some like, you know, you can do some UTM tracking on different publications. If we do a PR press somewhere, uh, um, we can track to see like using the link that's to the website there, how many users converted from that publication with a Web3 wallet or something like that. Um, so really, really interesting aspects, a little more deeper into different analytics and understanding the separation of different roles and target kind of metric target users that um, ads is going after for, for Q1 mostly being on the developer side. So yeah, really uh, gave me really good direction on giving more insights, as Zach mentioned, more impact to take this analytical information around our user base, around our community and start to drive decisions on where we post articles or what we post articles about or where we market and whatnot. So yeah, things are going really good. Rocking and rolling. Great. And if you do have any help requests from the community, feel free to drop it in chat. I realize we're getting close to the end of time here, so I'm just going to kind of push forward here. Um, Merdad, do you want to give any updates on what you're working on? Yeah, definitely. So we've been working on the treaty governance to make it automated, and we're basically done with it. We're just waiting on the third five three API. And if that's done, we are real go through the testing in the real world, which we are currently doing a part of it with the help of Pocket Scan and Ramiro. Big shout out to them for helping us. And yeah, if that's done, uh, we can move ahead with the governance. Also, Ben and I, we've been doing some scenario testing and so far so good. We're really happy about it. Great, thank you for the update. Do you have anything that you need from anybody? Any blockers, community requests? No, no, just one blocker, but it's not a community thing. We're just waiting on the third party service. Love it. Great. Thank you for that perfectly timed update. Um, and going down, does anybody want uh, want to talk from Node Fleet? I think I saw a few people on here. Yes, uh, I guess before. Uh, so um, a quick update we have is we dropped the UIs like two weeks ago. And right now, uh, we are selecting around six, uh, seven people from various uh, contexts so they can uh, uh, test the UI and, and see, you know, do, do like a quick uh, UX process. And from the development side, we already have uh, the, the, the blocks, the accounts, and we are working in, in indexing the transactions and working with the front end. We expect to have uh, something to show up for this month at the, at the end of this month, like a quick MVP for the Explorer. Um, and yeah, I'm moving on. We currently we don't have any blocker. 
And if you don't, uh, if in case you didn't see it, please uh, take a quick look at the socket that we have in the forum. That's all for for us. Thanks, Lol. Do you want to drop the link so that way people can just easily access that? Be very helpful. And then, um, Derek, I see you put your update in chat here. So, um, Derek yeah, has sure. done a uh, starter repo, um, starter repos and tutorials for some developer marketing. Um, his first video I thought was great, but um, I would love other people to take a, a peek at it and see how how they feel about it. Um, if there was anything that he could do differently, and uh, I'm just going to call out that he is looking for feedback on which video he should make next. So if people want to give him some ideas or suggest what might be um, a good next tutorial, that would be really helpful. All right, I think we got through it, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I will send out some details on the new impact form for next month. Um, and basically a big thank you to everybody who keeps showing up. Really, really happy to have you here. And I feel like this was a, a great call today led by Shane. So a little round of applause for you, Shane. Thank you, thank you. And the floor is open. Does anybody have any topics that they wanna bring up or anything from today's call that they wanna talk more about? I have one thing, please. Uh, v0.11 upgrades. Uh, we have only 38% of the uh, nodes upgraded, validators upgraded. So, um, yeah, we need more participation. The validators, please upgrade to V0.11. There are great features in it. Uh, we need your support uh, to get this through. Yeah, that's, that's, a, to reach, that's a great reach people. That's a great point. Uh, and uh, I'm, I mean, I think we're kind of getting to the point where we might need to reach out to specific folks that are running large amounts of validators. So, um, yeah, uh, if, you know, if, if you get, if anyone's got any connections, you know, the folks that, you know, are running a number of validators, feel free to give them a ping. I know I'm probably going to have to start pinging folks here, um, and connecting with some folks, uh, cause yeah, we, we, we definitely need to know what's, uh, what, people's thoughts are and uh, get get stuff upgraded ASAP. Yeah, if anybody has any ideas on the best way to reach everybody other than just DMing every uh, validator. Cool. I'm gonna leave the floor open for another. Go on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I would say a little bit more buzz at the announcements channels in your know, pocket server here and there. Uh, if it is just one announcement every two weeks, it's very easy to miss, easy to forget. And people might say, oh, you know, I, I have time, it's not rush. But it's like a little bit drumbeat, right? Sometimes management is, you know, you have to keep that rhythm, that beat going until mm -hmm. people start dancing to it. Sounds like a request to make another announcement uh, today to get people to update. So I'll make sure I take care of that. Uh, Coder, if you if you want to create the dance video, I'm sure we're, we'll be happy to circulate it. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll play drums. All right, y'all. One more minute here. Otherwise, we can start wrapping this up. All right, y'all, this is it. Appreciate everybody showing up today. Um, next week, it will be an hour later. So that way the protocol team can join us, which I think will be helpful as well. So um, sorry, not next week, next uh, call, which is in two weeks, will be an hour earlier. And then I also can make the announcement that next week's community call, Ben is going to be presenting on creds. So that's gonna be a little bit later as well. It's gonna be uh, noon Pacific. So that way he doesn't have to get up at 4 a.m. to present. All right, everybody. Appreciate you. Have a great rest of your week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you guys.